The Isle of Wight, Britain's most popular holiday centre, relies for its prosperity upon an expanding and reliable supply of electricity. A small amount of the island's electricity needs is supplied by a power station at Cowes, but the bulk is transmitted by submarine power cables across the Solent from the mainland. However, the Solent is a busy shipping lane with the consequent risk that the cables might be damaged, resulting in a reduced power supply to the island whilst repairs are carried out. To reduce this risk and to be sure that an adequate supply could be maintained, the authorities decided to install a third 132 kV three-core oil-filled submarine cable to augment two similar cables already in service and to act as a standby should any of the existing cables be damaged. Acting on behalf of the Southern Electricity Board, the submarine department of Balfour Beatty & Company Limited carried out the installation works in the spring and summer of 1972. To manufacture and transport a continuous length of cable for a three-mile submarine crossing would be a major task. And so the method adopted was to make the cable in manageable drum lengths of approximately 500 meters each and to join these lengths together into a coil on a specially adapted laying vessel. The vessel used for cable laying had originally been a German floating crane. But with the crane and engine removed and the deck fitted with a rotating turntable, she proved ideal for cable laying following sea trials. Before jointing could start, a drum of cable had to be mounted on the foredeck of the Lois, as the vessel had been renamed, and the cable pulled right through the joint bay and coiled down on the turntable. But with the trailing end resting in the bay. Then the leading end of a second drum was fed into the joint bay and the two ends overlapped. The jute servings were then removed and the armor wires laid back to expose the lead sheath. The ends cut precisely to length and then a sleeve for sealing the joint when completed was passed over one cable and supported. Next, the lead sheath was removed for a certain distance along the cable and the paper insulation unwound to expose the conductors. During the whole time the jointing was in progress, oil within the cable was kept at a positive pressure so that the paper insulation was never allowed to dry out or absorb air. The joint had to be as flexible as the cable itself and so conventional methods of jointing the copper conductors were unsuitable. The design called for a brazed joint that would be both mechanically and electrically equal to the core itself. During brazing, the insulation was protected from overheating by water chills placed on the conductors. When the conductors were fused together, they were allowed to cool, then excess brazing metal was filed off and smoothed to a diameter equal to that of the conductor. Each join was examined for possible voids by portable X-ray equipment. By developing the plates on site, the engineers knew in just over one hour that the joins were satisfactory and that work on the cable could continue. After brazing, the original cable insulation was stepped on each side of the join to form a gradual stress profile. And then the cores were re-insulated with layers of paper tape supplied by hand gaps were left in between each layer to assist flexibility. When insulation taping was complete on all cores, metallized paper tape screens were applied and the oil ducts replaced. The joint area was then constrained mechanically to the original cable diameter and the lead sleeve positioned and sealed to the cable sheath by lead burns. This intricate process ensured that the cable would have maximum flexibility together with the 100% oil seal so vitally necessary with this type of installation. Any air trapped in the joint had to be removed and so vacuum pumps were connected and operated for 12 hours continuously. 
constant watch was kept on the results being obtained, and after this period, a final impregnation test was carried out before releasing the joint to the jointers. The six millimeter diameter armor protection wires on each side were replaced and butt welded. The weld area was then treated with anti-corrosion paint and the outer serving reapplied. This took the form of 30 feet of whipped tarred sisal yarn applied tightly over the joint to prevent bird caging of the armor wires during the laying operation. The jointed cable was then coiled onto the turntable and the whole procedure repeated when a new length of cable was moved into position. The cable had been made at the Erith works of BICC. Each drum of cable weighed some 30 tons and two such drums were required on site every 10 days to allow for jointing up. The Lois was berthed across the water from Southampton docks for cable jointing and every 10 days she left her moorings and was towed to Southampton to meet the cable transporter. First to go on board was a supply of joints and jointing materials. Then, with the empty drums removed, the new drums were loaded onto the vessel. After which, the Lois was returned to her moorings at the shipyard and jointing continued. In all, 11 lengths of cable were jointed in this way and with the total cable on the turntable measuring nearly 5,000 meters, the vessel was prepared for the laying operation. By now, the original engine room space on the Lois had been converted into a miniature powerhouse with generators for lighting and driving the deck machinery and compressors for driving the turntable braking system. Even so, the Lois had no propulsion system of her own and was entirely dependent on tugs for maneuvering and forward movement. Unsettled weather conditions had delayed the start of the laying program, but eventually a favorable weather forecast covering a period of eight days enabled the operation to be got underway. Tugs were secured alongside and the cable laying vessel was slowly eased out into the water. With a full weight of cable on board together with the cable laying equipment and ancillary machinery, the Lois had only four feet of freeboard. Fairly small waves could therefore have washed over her deck and entered the buoyancy spaces had the weather been unfavorable. And with only a slight swell and sea, the tugs alongside could have damaged themselves and the Lois. Hence the need for a long-range, reliable weather forecast. This also meant that the actual start of the laying operation would be further delayed if winds above force four were likely to be encountered for the next 24 hours. After a two-hour journey from the shipyard, the Lois was moored off Leap on the mainland. First, the leading end of the cable would be hauled to the shore, and then the Lois would move across the Solent laying cable. At Thorness Bay, she would be moored close inshore and the final length pulled in. At the point of the crossing, the distance from shore to shore between the mainland and the Isle of Wight is 3,962 metres. But due to the configuration of the seabed, the total amount of cable to be laid would amount to just under 5,000 metres. On the mainland, a winch had been securely positioned at the point of the crossing and a continuous wire bond extended out to the cable laying vessel moored about 800 metres offshore. To this bond, the leading end of the cable had been attached and was drawn slowly towards the shore. On board the Lois, barrels were attached to the cable, one barrel to about every two metres, as it left the turntable. The barrels acted as buoyancy floats, 
and suspended the cable just below the surface of the water as it was hauled slowly towards the shore. On shore, men stood by to cut the barrels away as the leading end of the cable approached. A deep trench had been cut across the beach and up the foreshore through which the cable passed on its way to its final position. As soon as the cable came to rest, all the flotation barrels between ship and shore were released and the cable allowed to sink to the seabed. The barrels were then recovered for use later. On the following day, after a final confirmation from the Southampton Weather Centre, the compact cable-laying armada set off on its journey to Thorness Bay, laying cable. Three 600 horsepower tugs were employed, one ahead, imparting forward movement, and one either side to steady the Lois on course. Cable was paid out over the stern of the vessel at a rate of approximately one and a half meters per second, while the Lois maintained an average speed of three knots. Instructions regarding speed and course were directed from the bridge to the three tugs. The speed of the turntable was controlled during the lay by air brakes acting on the rim. The brakes are small in relation to the mass of the turntable with its load of cable, and the engineer in charge of this operation had to play the brakes like a fisherman plays a large salmon. The first of the ten flexible joints slides easily down the cable slipway and into the water. Meter by meter, Lois paid out her load of cable into the Solent. Up aloft, navigation signals warned shipping that the vessel was laying cable and was therefore not manoeuvrable. was maintained by a combination of theodolites placed ahead on the island and astern on the mainland, and the speed of the turntable was regulated according to the profile of the seabed. On the island, two transit beacons lit with four 600-watt bulbs were placed on high ground. These acted as direction indicators for the Lois as she neared the end of her voyage. By now it was late in the afternoon and in the gathering gloom the Lois sailed on the last few hundred metres of her journey. On the mainland a high sandbank had prevented the vessel getting closer inshore than 800 metres. But here at Thorness the seabed is flat and the vessel was able to get within 400 metres of the shore. As the vessel neared the shore, the engineer in charge issued instructions to slow the engines and the Lois, with only a few metres of cable on the turntable, slowly came to rest. With the main lay successfully completed, the Lois was secured on six moorings in the shallow waters of Thorness Bay. Between the ship and the mainland, there now rested some 3,500 metres of cable on the seabed. The next day, preparations were put in hand to pull the shore end of cable. This was on a drum mounted on the foredeck of the Lois. A pulling eye was attached 
and the cable hauled shoreward by winches secured on land. Now the turntable on the Lois was used as a capstan both to assist the haul off and to reduce the bending radius on the cable. Although the water was comparatively shallow at this point, drums were again used to float the cable ashore. Since the operation was carried out at low water, rollers could be used to ease the cable over the shingle of the bay. On shore, men stood by to guide the nose of the cable over the rollers. So the end of the cable was winched to its final position some 75 metres beyond high water. On board in the joint bay, the ends of the cables were brought together and once again the jointers moved in to complete the last joint to be made on the submarine section of the circuit. When completed, the joint and cable bite were lowered over the side and onto the seabed. Whilst the marine operations were being carried out, other works were in progress on the island. A land cable was jointed to the submarine cable and this was laid to a small terminal station almost hidden in the trees on higher ground. From here, power from the cable would be switched and distributed into the island's power transmission network. At Leap on the mainland, a small oil house is inconspicuously sighted amid the trees. In it is the equipment that will keep the oil in the submarine cable under positive pressure at all times. This equipment was designed and manufactured by Bicotest of Chesant, a member of the Balfour Beatty organization. Above ground, all that can be seen is a sign to warn shipping that power cables cross the Solent at that point. Beneath the water, however, power can flow from the mainland to the Isle of Wight. A new cable interconnection, ensuring that all the power needs of the people on the island can be met and maintained, thanks to the combined efforts and skill of Balfour Beatty & Company Limited, BICC Aerith and the Southern Electricity Board.